many of the defendants that come before this court for sentencing. It is the way that she has lived her life. When a couple takes vows at the altar during a wedding, they make a promise that they will protect each other. But there are individuals out there who not only break this promise, but also inflict violence on their spouses themselves. At this point, you don't at all think that Amy's cheating on you. No. From someone violently ending their wife to someone feeling no remorse for their actions. Mr. Four Person, how say you? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the charge of first degree murder? Guilty. Here are some incidents where wife killers reacting to death sentences. I just want to say um, to the lawyers uh, that it's been my pleasure to preside over um, such a well-tried case. The case was centered around a woman named Kara Rintala. On March 29th, 2010, Anna Marie was found deceased in the basement of her family's home. Police received a 911 call and investigation led to Kara. She was arrested and charged with first degree murder. Not all cases are the same. Each one poses different sets of challenges. It is the jury's duty to meticulously examine each and every variable and evidence to come with a just decision. Did that happen here? You may. What say you, Madam Poor Person? Has the jury agreed upon its verdict in Hampshire County Indictment 1180CR0128, the Commonwealth versus Carol Mantala? We have. If you could please give your verdict slips to the court officer. What say you, Madam Four Person, as to count one of Hampshire County indictment charging the defendant, Kara Rintala, with murder? Is she not guilty, guilty of murder in the first degree, guilty of murder in the second degree, or guilty of voluntary manslaughter? We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Members of the jury, hearken to your verdict as the court will record it. You, upon your oaths, do say that the defendant, Kara Rintala, is guilty of voluntary manslaughter. This is the unanimous verdict of the jury, so say you, Madam Foreperson. So say you, all members of the jury. Yes. Thank you. Judge, may the jurors be individually polled. Can I see you inside, Mark? of the jury. Um, on behalf of the court, I want to thank you uh, for the significant amount of time and attention that you have dedicated uh, to this matter. I'm going to send you back to the jury room one last time. Uh, I will be back shortly to uh, talk to you um, one last time.
Commonwealth. Your Honor, the Commonwealth moves for sentencing. Uh, we would request that Kara Rintala's bail be revoked in the interim, and we would request a brief continuance of the sentencing to allow the Commonwealth to consult not only amongst itself, but with uh, Anna Marie Cochran's family. We would ask for something perhaps uh, as early as next week. As far as the bail revocation, Your Honor, uh, as you know, voluntary manslaughter carries a maximum potential penalty of up to 20 years in state prison. The Commonwealth does intend to uh, request an additional period of incarceration for the defendant. Given the stakes, uh, we believe that revocation of her bail is appropriate. Um, Judge, we'd ask that the court continue her bail uh, when she was faced with a homicide, a first-degree murder uh, indictment, which had the possibility of life without the possibility of parole. Um, she came to court every day. She appeared at every appearance. Um, she has a GPS on her ankle. We'd be looking for about two weeks to put together a sentencing memo, Judge. We would be asking this court to consider um, imposing time served, uh, which was something that we discussed before this trial even happened, the Commonwealth and, and us. So, so we're asking that that be something that we are going to ask the court and we want to put together in a coherent way, and we need two weeks to do it, Judge. Okay. We would ask that, this, uh, that my client not be, her bill not be revoked under the circumstances. She face, faces less time now than she did prior to um, this trial, and she has done, she has had no issues at all um, with respect to uh, any of uh, the, the GPS concerns. She's reported to probation as as uh, she is required to, and so far she's already served seven years, Judge. Two years prior to trial and five years post-conviction. Okay, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do um, when it comes time to sentence the defendant. Uh, I understand that um, she's been out for some time um, and was facing a more serious charge than the one that she's just been um, or of which she's just been convicted, but she stands convicted at this point. So uh, I'm going to revoke her bail. Um, do you have a date in mind? I think two weeks is the defendant's request. No. I'm sorry, Judge. Can I just have a minute? Sure. Yeah, the afternoon would be better. One week or two weeks. One week or two weeks. Just two weeks. Okay. I was talking to him and I shut off my phone. I just need to get my calendar out. So we need to do 2 p.m. on the 19th. It'll be two weeks. It'll be two weeks. October 19th. If that's agreeable to the court. At 11 a.m. or 2 p.m. Have a video at what time? 11 or 2, whichever to the court's preference. We are expecting that we're going to be having a civil trial that week, so it would be 2. We do have a number of quick matters. Okay. Well, would 2 o'clock, would, would that be sufficient time? Yes. Okay. October 19th at 2 p.m. That's for sentencing. Kara Rintala, after bail having been revoked, you are in the custody of the court officers. I'm going to go back and speak to the jury, but I, I just want to say um, to the lawyers uh, that it's been my pleasure to preside over um, such a well-tried case. Um, your dedication to this case and your craft was, was evident to me, uh, and I'm grateful for it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just like the jury, a judge is also tasked with the difficult duty of handing out a proper sentencing. They have to take every detail of the case into account and also have to make sure at the end of the justice have prevailed. Well, the taking of a life is a, a terrible thing. Uh, it's the ultimate harm uh, for Anna Marie, 
was the end of the world. Every experience she ever had or ever would have was taken from her forever. And there is collateral damage uh, about which I've heard a great deal uh, today. Uh, a ripple effect. The lives of all those who loved uh, Anna Marie are forever altered and diminished. Her mother and father who suffered every parent's worst nightmare. A brother, a sister-in-law, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, all of them have lost someone very dear to them. A daughter who lost a mother before she was able to form a lasting memory of her. Even the letters in support of the defendant speak to the suffering of Anna Marie and the defendant's daughter, and I heard that firsthand today. Deprived of the love, the support, and guidance of a parent, and two parents in this case. The burden on the defendant's aging parents, I understand that as well. But I sense that the author of some of these letters do not accept the jury's verdict uh, as they speak of the defendant suffering too, as if she is also a victim in this case. Now, I do not blame the defendant for the, uh, or hold against her in any way the procedural path that this, take, this case has taken with all its twists and turns. She had a right to defend herself, to go to trial as many times as was necessary. Uh, it is not up to the Commonwealth to punish her, that is my job. And I would not, nor would I ever punish a defendant, any defendant for exercising the right to go to trial. But I accept the jury's verdict in this case, as I must. And everything that I do flows from that acceptance. Everything is based on that legal fact that the defendant killed her wife. And so her daughter's suffering, the suffering of everyone involved, ultimately is on the defendant and on her alone. It is her responsibility what has happened here. But those letters also provide very useful background. They tell me uh, about uh, the defendant, who she is. This thing that the defendant did is certainly part of who she is, but it's not all of who she is. I understand that. Like Anna Marie, the defendant's professional life was devoted to helping others. As an EMT, like Anna Marie, as a firefighter, the defendant's job was to render aid to save lives, not to take them. And I'm sure uh, that at certain times and to certain people, the defendant was a hero, just like Anna Marie. And so it is not merely her lack of criminal history that sets her apart from the many of the defendants that come before this court for sentencing. It is the way that she has lived her life. By so many accounts, the defendant has been, for the most part, a good person in so many ways to so many people. A caring mother, a productive member of society, I accept the truth of that, even though this version of her uh, is difficult to reconcile with the evidence uh, I viewed at trial, the image of Anna Marie lying on the basement floor, dead as the defendant drove her daughter to the mall. Which brings me to the nature of this offense and the circumstances surrounding the commission of this crime, the jury. I found that the defendant killed her wife, but it did not find her guilty of murder. And I must accept that as well, which means that the jury found uh, the defendant uh, guilty of a less serious offense than murder, which uh, comes with uh, a much lower uh, sentencing range uh, and guidelines. In reaching that verdict, the jury would have found that the Commonwealth had proved the elements of murder, but that there were mitigating circumstances or perhaps more precisely that the Commonwealth had not proven the absence of mitigating circumstances beyond a reasonable doubt. And so I must also give the defendant the benefit of that doubt. Now I cannot speculate and like the jury, I have no information about what transpired in the moments before Anna Marie was killed. But I must assume 
for the purposes of sentencing that there was some provocation, some heated argument or physical confrontation that overwhelmed the defendant's capacity for reflection or restraint or caused her to act out of emotion rather than reason reflection. So I must consider uh, her uh, less culpable uh, having committed this crime in the heat of passion. But the defendant's state of mind aside, given what the evidence at this trial revealed about the type and number of injuries Anna Marie sustained and the ultimate cause of death, I do agree with the Commonwealth that this was an especially brutal crime. Sentencing is the hardest part of my job. To assign appropriate weight to the competing factors like the ones at play here is a daunting task. While the Kara hurt her own spouse, our next individual carried out his heinous act on the neighbor in a fit of rage. At this time, Mr. King, in case number 18 CF 40435 CF, um, I'll adjudicate you guilty of murder in the first degree. The case was centered around Chu Feng Ki. On January 23rd, 2018, Chu Feng Ki ended the life of his neighbor, Edward Tudor, in the front yard of his Pasco County home. The police quickly identified Chu Feng Ki as the perpetrator of the heinous crime. He was then charged with first degree premeditated murder. The judge finally decided what would happen to Chu Feng Ki after conceding every aspect. Did justice prevail? Let's find out. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want to thank you for your time and attention in this difficult type of case. I also wish to advise you of some very special privileges enjoyed by you as jurors. No juror can ever be required to talk about the discussions that have occurred in the jury room except by court order. For many centuries, our society has relied on jurors for consideration in such difficult cases. We have recognized for hundreds of years that your jury deliberations, discussions, and votes should remain your private affairs as long as you wish it. Therefore, the law gives you a unique privilege not to speak about your jury work. Although you are now at liberty to speak with anyone about your deliberations, you are also at liberty to refuse to speak to anyone about them. A request to discuss either your verdict or your deliberations may come from those who are simply curious, from those who might seek to find fault with you, from the media, from the attorneys, or elsewhere. It will be up to you individually to decide whether to preserve your privacy as jurors. In, um, all the rules about tweeting, texting, or blogging are lifted, so if you want to go home and tell everybody about the fine time you here, had here working on this case and Twitter or Facebook or whatever social media, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, if people ask you a question, you can just tell them you don't want to talk about it. So it's completely up to you individually. I have a certificate of appreciation for each of you. If you want to go ahead and take your juror badge and go ahead and put it down in front of you, um, at this time, I'm going to excuse you as a juror in this matter. If you would like to remain and watch um, anything that the sentencing afterwards, you're more than welcome to do that. We'll just have you gather your things and you can have a seat in the back. If you do not wish to stay, you do not have to. You're more than welcome to just go on home for the day. Uh, but we are going to move on to the sentencing phase. I don't know if we're going to complete it today or put it, pick another day because I have talked to lawyers about that since I hadn't gotten the verdict yet. But if you want to watch, remain and watch, you're more than uh, welcome to do that. All right? So thank you very much for your time and attention. I have a certificate of appreciation. And um, we are going to have to give you your cell phones back this time. I'm sorry. All right, Mr. Pierre, Ms. Garrett, if you want to approach with Mr. Keyes, if you have a podium for me. Um, Mr. Pierre, does, um, due to the indictment, the jury's uh, decision, and the verdict form, there's only one sentence for the court to impose. So I don't know if you're ready to proceed with that today. Judge, we are, um, Mr. Key is entitled to a pre-sentence investigation and then do the charge with the verdict and due to the fact that he has no prior record. However, Mr. Keyes uh, wishes to waive his right to a pre-sentence investigation and a pre-sentence report and wishes to be sentenced today so we can initiate the proceeding. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you
State, are you ready to proceed with sentencing today? Yes, sir. All right, do you have members of his, uh, the victim's family that wish to, to speak to the court before I proceed with sentencing? No, sir. All right, and um, based on the law and the decision of the jury, at this time, Mr. Key, in case number 18 CF 40435 CF, um, I'll adjudicate you guilty of murder in the first degree. And um, the only sentence that the court can impose in this case is life without the possibility of parole. So at this time, I'm going to sentence you to life without the possibility of parole. Um, and you, can you afford to hire an attorney for an appeal? OK. I know that there was a civil verdict against any of the assets that you hold outside of the court. So at this time, I'm going to find that you're also indigent for appeal purposes and appoint the public defender for appeal. Uh, is there anything else the state would like the court to impose? Any other costs, um, um, restitution and whatnot? Uh, good. All right, so there's the normal $550 of court costs and fines and $250 for the Office of the Public Defender. Um, Mr. Keurig, is your client waived any breakdown of those costs? Yes, he does. All right, and then there's $100 to the state. I'm not gonna impose any surcharges in this matter. Um, those will be imposed as a lien against him and on 30 days to appeal. Mr. Keith, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. While the neighbor was the one who fell victim to Feng's outburst, our next individual showed no mercy for his own wife before brutally ending her life. We are negative when we strive to be positive. We're sad when we strive to be happy. The case was centered around a 46-year-old man named William Argy. On April 4th, 2019, his 39-year-old wife, Maureen Argy, was found lifeless at their house on West Road, according to investigators. Police have arrested William for allegedly ending the life of his wife, in their home. The jury, after examining every detail of the case and what was said throughout the court proceedings, reached a verdict that was fair and just. Mr. Archie, please rise and take the jury. Would the four person please stand? Mr. Four person, has the jury reached a verdict on each of the charges? Yes. Mr. Four person, how say you? Is the defendant guilty? or not guilty of the charge of falsification of physical evidence. Guilty. The four person has said guilty as to that charge. So say you all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Yes. Mr. Four person, how say you, is the defendant guilty or not guilty of the charge of first degree murder? Guilty. The four person has said guilty as to that charge. So say you all, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Whenever a life is lost, those who are closed to the person are the most affected. However, it is the mother who is the one who truly goes through the most heartbreak. No parent wants to outlive their children. Maureen's mother was no different. My name is Ann Goddard. I'm Maureen's mother. This is written to Maureen from me. How does one measure loss? How can I explain my loss to the court, to strangers? Shortly after you were killed, I wrote a list of your attributes and behaviors that I would miss. I keep them with me on my phone, but I found I didn't want my statement to become just an impersonal list of your characteristics. It needed a context. My answer is to write a letter to you. Others can read along or listen, but it is you I need to speak to. And there it is. I miss knowing I will never have another conversation with you. I miss talking to you a phone call, an email, a quick text. I missed a chance to share news with you about family, friends, and acquaintances. I miss being able to ask your advice and opinions about so many things, clothes, recipes, health issues, family relationships. You were my sounding board when I had concerns or questions. I miss the opportunity to trade new recipes, provide ideas about mundane household tasks, to share book titles, to recommend TV shows to watch, to suggest experiences, to seek out and explore. I miss, miss, miss you at family gatherings, holidays, birthdays, various celebrations. You are missing and missed as a daughter, a mother, a sister, a daughter-in-law, a sister-in-law, a niece, an aunt, a cousin, a friend. 
I miss you as my companion, as together we watched Ella and Gavin enjoy the beach, play with their cousins, ride their bikes, go on adventures. Just being with you, watching the wonderful mother you had become. And I miss knowing you won't be there when I'm old. Selfishly, I want you to call me, ask me how I am, how do I feel, anything you can do for me. I miss being able to check in with you about you, your extended family and your work. I miss catching up with you about Eller and Gavin's school experiences, their sports and other activities and interests. I miss watching you as a mother, nurture and guide Eller and Gavin, steering them through their growing up years. You won't be able to share with me news about Ella's boyfriends and Gavin's girlfriends. I won't hear news of sports teams, games, and outcomes. I won't hear your excitement when Ella attends her first prom. I won't hear your stress when Ella and Gavin begin to drive. I hate that you will miss so many firsts and rites of passage that were yours to experience as their mother. I feel your absence at different times as something physical or emotional. Something as simple as a song, the weather, a phrase heard, a passage read in a book, a scene on TV will trigger a memory. And with each memory comes the emotion. It's a visceral feeling. I miss your presence. Memories of you help me to recall your feelings of happiness, aggravation, appreciation, anxiety, satisfaction. And the memories help me to remember the hopes and dreams you had for yourself and for your family. Sometimes the memory is so bold, so real, that the pain is like a physical punch. And sometimes the pain feels dull, like a film of sadness that will diminish my reactions to daily lives, daily events. I believe my heart will always have a scar. During one of our last conversations, I told you that you were strong, that you would get through this tough time of separation and divorce. I told you that you had an inner strength and you were resilient. I told you that Eller and Gavin would be all right because of you. But did I tell you how much I admired you? Putting together a photo album for Eller and Gavin after your death, I was filled with pride and admiration for the work you did in AmeriCorps. My favorite picture of you is standing on top of a roof on a house, wearing your tool belt, working with Habitat for Humanity. So brave you were to go away to an unknown area with team members you had never met. So much you accomplished, repairing trails in the Appalachians, tax preparation for seniors and low-income people, clothing drives for the needy, painting rooms indoors and buildings outdoors at schools and churches, for youth groups, replanting dune habitats in the Outer Banks. You showed such strength of character and determination to realize your goal. After your death, your friends and colleagues reached out to our family. Did you know that in Billerica there is a beautiful tree, a Donald Wyman crabapple tree, planted in your memory with a plaque acknowledging your dedication and work ethic? The tree changes color seasonally as a visual reminder of you. And in Methuen, the community room is named in your honor with your picture. And at Gallagher Park in Lynn, Auntie Kathy had a memorial bench installed in your memory as a place parents and caregivers could rest as they watched their children at the playground. There have been many donations and contributions to charitable groups made in your memory. My circle of friends continue to express concern and provide tangible support to our family how you would have hated all that attention, but how you impacted so, so many people. This loss has affected relationships within our family and within our friends. I feel lucky to have Dad as we try to navigate through this horrific experience. I feel blessed with Matt, Aaron, and my four beautiful grandchildren. They are a reason to celebrate family, but my heart remains heavy. Joy and happiness are lessened and optimism and positivity are tempered. Your death changed our whole family. Now we are critical as we strive to celebrate. We are negative when we strive to be positive. We're sad when we strive to be happy. We cry when we seek to laugh. We are impatient when we strive to be patient. But we will continue to move forward, holding on tightly to each other. I will try to embrace your legacy of compassion and care for others as I move forward on this uncharted journey. But sadly for me, what I wish for and can never have is to see you, talk to you, hug you, tell you I love you. This is my loss. My heart is broken for Ella and Gavin. I feel sad, upset, angry, and heartsick about the impact of your loss on Ella and Gavin. 
It is just not right what happened to them, to have their mother taken from them, their entire world upended, their lives changed forever. I will do my best to ensure that they know all about you, the child you were and the adult you became. I will let them know the immeasurable love you held for them and that you were the center of choices that you made. And I will try to foster your spirit of helping others in need through examples and hands-on projects with Eller and Gavin. My fervent prayer is that you did not suffer, that you did not feel any pain or hope, that you not, were not aware of what was happening, as it upsets me so much to think of you gasping and scared. I am thankful, grateful, and proud to have been your mother. I would not have changed that fact. You were a blessing in my life, and I will carry you forever in my heart. I love you. The judge finally delivered the sentencing for the horrific act William carried out. She made sure that Maureen's mother could finally have closure. I'll first do um, in post sentence and then I have a few comments that I'll share. Mr. Aji, upon uh, finding of guilty as it relates to the charge of falsification of physical evidence, case ID 1698230C, uh, you are hereby sentenced as follows to the New Hampshire State Prison for not more than three nor less than one and a half years. There's added to the minimum a disciplinary period equal to 150 days for each year of the minimum term to be prorated for any part of the year. It's to be served stand committed, commencing forthwith 911 days of pretrial confinement credit. This will run concurrently with the sentence I will impose on the first degree murder charge in 1698229C. You are further ordered to participate meaningfully in and complete any counseling, treatment, or education as directed by probation or corrections. You're allowed to be awarded earned time reductions. Law enforcement can destroy or return evidence to its rightful owner. You would be of good behavior and comply with all terms and conditions of my order. As it relates to the first degree murder charge, you are hereby sentenced as follows to not more than life nor less than life, and you shall not be eligible for parole. There is again added the disciplinary period, as I've already noted. You're again entitled to 911 days of pretrial confinement credit, and that is staying committed, commencing forthwith. Uh, there is a restitution obligation that is set forth in the addendum, uh, which uh, the state has commented on uh, the, the addendum will include um, $6,000 to be paid to the good debts for funeral expenses and further paid um, uh, a cap of $6,000 to the New Hampshire Victims Comp Program for funeral expenses. Restitution is going to be paid through the Department of Corrections as directed um, and to commence immediately. At the request of Mr. R.G. or the Department of Corrections, a hearing can be scheduled on the amount and method of payment and restitution. Um, any um, such request has to, be has to be made within 30 days of today's date, or it'll be deemed waived. While William received a just sentence for his actions, there is no sentence severe enough for our next individual for the way he took his wife's life. Did you ever have any doubt about you being the biological parents of your children? No. The incident revolves around Todd Mullis. In November 2018, Todd Mullis ended the life of his wife with a corn rake on their Earlville farm. Soon after, the police were able to connect him to the murder and then decided to press charges against him. Any criminal who commits a crime has to answer a lot of inquiries. No matter how much they try to hide details that might incriminate them, it will be caught. Now, Todd, I just want to talk a little bit more about a few more things. So when you're at, when you, you call 911 on November 10th, 2018, and you pull over, because 911 tells you to, right? Yes. And you pull over, and they tell you to get Amy out of the car. No. Or, I'm sorry, to lay her flat. Yeah, I... Because they want you to be able to do CPR. You remember that? Because yeah. eventually you yep. do some CPR. Is yes. that right? And uh, just so that we can, where we all understand, where is it that you perform the CPR on Amy? 
I started in the truck. In the truck. And are you in the truck until Luke Thompson arrives? I'm standing. Or I'm sorry, you're like leaning inside the truck, would that be fair to say? Yes. And is Amy, is she seated in the passenger seat with the seat down? Yes. Or? Okay. So when they tell you to do uh, chest compressions, your half of your body's in the car and you're, that's what you're doing. You're using your mouth and your hands to do that. I did not use my mouth. Oh, I'm sorry. So you're just, uh, you're just pressing. Where's Tristan? At that point, I told him to go stand by the road for when they, to flag him down if they were coming. So as you're doing those chest compressions, is anyone else there initially? No. And you're holding onto that phone, and you're doing the chest compressions. I had my shoulder holding my phone against my ear. So at that point, the only the only people in the car are you and Amy, right? Yes. And at this point. You don't at all think that Amy's cheating on you. No. You confronted her. You put it to bed. Yes. You, even after the rumors a month later, you still didn't think she was cheating on you because she told you she wasn't. Right? Yes. And even in those months, um, I know you told some people she was really moody. She was having some issues, right? She had a lot going on all summer. So she, she, because she had all the stuff going on in Ankeny, right? Yes. She was going up there. She was visiting a lot. She had her grandma die. Her uncle had problems. You said in those in those two months, in, the, in September and October, she was gone about 30 days. There was a stretch in there. I, Yeah. And she would come and go, but she was gone a, quite a bit, right? Yes. And things are getting a little bit tense at home. No. So you're not upset at all about this? I was con- I was needing help at home, and I right. And I, well, I guess you could call it some tension, I guess. Well, and you're so, calling Eileen Fuller, Amy's stepmother, around this time, right? Yes. And you're telling her this is hard, right? I'm harvesting. Yeah. I'm yeah. taking care of the kids, and I know yeah. Amy's got stuff going on, but I need some help, right? Yes. And thankfully, you have your family close by, and they're helping a lot. Yes. But still throughout those months where she's spending a lot of time in Ankeny, you're not worried that she's cheating. Right? No. You know she's just dealing with her family. Right? Yes. And it would it be fair to say you almost like forgot about the whole thing with Jerry Frazier because you didn't think anything was happening? I, for, I did not put Jerry in and, at all. And so on November 10th, 2018, when this happens to Amy, you're not at all suspicious that she's cheating. That she's cheating, no. At that point, you are not, you don't have one worry that she's cheating. No. And when you're actually there giving her CPR and you're giving those chest compressions, all you're thinking about is your wife, right? Yes. You're thinking about how you're trying to save her life. Yes. And you're thinking you're doing everything. Because you. I think you even say on the 911 tape, I'll do anything, right? When they asked me to do CPR, I said I'll do whatever and, will and, help her. And you mean that, that. You'll do anything at that point to help save your wife. Yes. And you start those chest compressions, right? Yes. And you heard that tape when we played it the other day, right? Yes. And at that point, what are you thinking when you're doing that? Trying to, trying to get her to come back. You're just trying to save her. Yes. Right? Um, Todd, while you're doing those, ch- do you, did you, I, I know it was kind of hard to hear on that tape, but you're doing those chest compressions. How long do you think you're doing them for? Not very long. A minute or, minute or two. And then I think it's Deputy Thompson shows up. And then yes. I, does he take over or somebody else takes over? He started... Okay. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, can I publish um, a, a clip of the 911 tape? Yes, go ahead. And just for the record, Judge, this is State's Exhibit Number 2. Now, Todd, here I'm going um, to play you the part where you're doing the chest compressions, and I'm just going to ask that you listen in between the chest compressions, okay? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So, Chad, did you just hear that whisper at the end of that? Yes. And what did you whisper? I couldn't hear it. Okay, I'm going to play it again. Todd, do you whisper cheating whore right there? No. So you don't remember what you whispered? No. Okay, I'm gonna play another clip for you. Do, do you know what you whispered there? No. Did you hear that? So I'm gonna play that part one more time. The first clip is 6.53 of that second tape. And this second one is right at 7, um, I'm sorry, 0700. Just try to listen really closely. I just wanna know if you remember what you said. <laughs> Right there, do you say, go to hell, cheating whore? No. So you don't hear that? No. You didn't hear at 6.53, cheating whore? You didn't hear that? I didn't hear that word. And it's right at that, after you hear a ping, you don't hear, go to hell, cheating whore? No. I have nothing for the judge. Any redirect? Todd, uh, the state asked you if Amy wanted to quit the hospital after this first affair. Remember that question? Yes. Did she, do you remember her announcing to her friends and coworkers that she was leaving the hospital? Yes. How did she do that? She did a... Uh... Facebook announcement, and she even had a, a party at a bar. Okay. When, when you and Tristan realized that the pet carrier wasn't up by the shop door. What did the two of you try to figure out or what did you decide to do, I guess is a better question. We were just talking, I wonder why, why it wasn't there. What, she either couldn't, you know, we were thinking that she either couldn't get it out of there or she didn't even attempt. She didn't even go over there in the first place? One or the other. Okay. And I'm, I'm just going to follow some questions along so they may jump around. Um, there was a series of questions about where Amy was located when you first saw her in the shed. Um, and... They also ask you about your knowledge of, of the advisability of not pulling something out of a person that's penetrated them. You remember those questions? Yes. Were you able to get Amy out the door with the whole, with the fork stuck in her back? There's no way. So you didn't have a choice? No. You were also asked about when you last saw that fork and you said something about the grass on the grass and that you moved it? Yes. In that shed, um, in, have you looked at all the photographs that the state took in there? Yes, I think so. Were there any children's toys in there? Yes. Well, what were there? There was a multitude of stuffed animals 
and play items on the wagon. The kids obviously played out there then. Yes, they played a lot. And things might get moved out of the shed that shouldn't be? Yes. You told the the, uh, state that while in the hog barn that morning, you never went to the office. Is that correct? After she left, I never went to the office. Did Did you go through the office when you left, though? Yes. Were you in the office when you and Tristan looked out and and didn't see the pet carrier? Yes. There also was some questions about the closest point between the hog barn and the red shed. And you tell us again what that would be. I estimated at 150 feet or so. And that'd be from what point on the hog barn? The very, very southwest tip of the barn by the door. They go in and out to the very northeast corner of the red shed. And when you say the door, that's the door going into the office of the hog barn? Yes. Todd, why did you do the searches on or about, I think it was July 26th, for uh, Jerry Frazier and his wife? I was trying to find a way to contact Christy. Christy being his wife. Christy was his wife. I I was trying to find a way to contact her. So this, if the search related to Jerry, you had Jerry's contact. I had Jerry's contact, but I... I had no way of getting her phone number. On some of those entries, uh, those searches that uh, the state asked you a few of them about, uh, thrill of the kill, thrill of the hunt, hunt man, uh, thirst for hunt, that kind of thing, you indicated you recognized those. Yes. And, And what did they relate to? There was a quote stated in a movie and it was actually ended up being Ernest Hemingway quote, and we were remember, trying to remember what it was. Do you remember what the name of the movie was? Uh, I think it was Predators. Did you ever have any doubt about you being the biological parents of your children? No. Do you have any reason to search for those DNA things? No, I have no reason to. When the state ask you questions about you contacting Jerry and his wife in July of 2018. They said, I think the words they used was, did you confront them about the affair? Did you, had you concluded that there was an affair? No, I did not. You had concerns about all those text messages? Yes. When you talked to Jerry, 
did he convince you that there was nothing going on? Yes. Mo I mean, for the most part, yes. He was very convincing. Todd, when you were doing those chest compressions, in the, if, if I understand you correctly, you had put Amy somewhat upright in the seat of the pickup but leaned it back as far as it would go? Yes. So she was in a kind of a, a reclining chair position? Yes. And I, you were holding your, the phone and, and doing the compressions at the same time? Yes. You knew you were on a recorded line with a 911 operator. Yes. Were you, do you believe that you said, whispered, cheating whore or go to hell, cheating whore while you were doing CPR? No. Were you frantic? I was very excited. Were you doing everything you could to keep her alive? Yes. No other questions? Did he recross? Just briefly, Judge. Todd, that first search about the DNA is how to tell if a child is yours, right? If that's what it says. And Amy gave birth to your children, right? They came out of yes. her body. Yes. And you also, um, your attorney just asked you about, you didn't really think they were having an affair in May. You were just wondering what's going on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, in uh, July. You are just wondering if Jerry and Amy, if there's something, they're talking too much. They were talking too much, yes. So you didn't really think they were having an affair? No. But you did text Terry Stainer. Do you think Amy's acting like she was before? Right? If that's what I text, yeah. And Well, you saw those texts, right? I don't... Do you remember seeing them the other day? I couldn't see the screen. Okay. But you, when you sent that text, you were referring to, is she acting like before, like having an affair, right? Yeah. And you called Jerry Frazier's wife. I know you called a second time to apologize, but you called that first time to see if she suspected anything. He will receive the fruits of his labor. In this instance, Todd's actions warranted the sentence that the judge handed down. Mr. Mullis, you have the right to speak today if you'd like to. You're not required to. Your attorney has uh, spoken on your behalf. This is the only chance you'll get to speak today before I present, uh, before, before I pronounce judgment. Is there anything you would like to say today? I did not do this. Uh, this is supposed to be America where you have a fair chance of proving your innocence. We shouldn't have to prove your innocence instead of the other way around. I thought it was guilty until, or not, uh, Innocent until proven guilty. I feel this is the other way around. And I was a faithful and loving husband, and I never did this. Okay, thank you, sir. Mr. Hamrock, do you have anybody else that would like to speak on behalf of your client? No, Judge. Are there any victims that wish to be heard today? Not, I, not I live know. testimony, Your Honor. The state did file a victim impact statement, and we would just ask that Your Honor, Honor read that. Okay. And there is a victim impact statement in the court file. I have read that and I have conferred with counsel to make sure that they have had the opportunity to see that, that both parties have had the opportunity to see the victim impact statement. I will take that into consideration as if it were offered here live at the sentencing hearing. Defense counsel indicated that uh, the sentence in this case is mandatory. He's right, it is mandatory. There's really no discretion um, as to the punishment handed down. 
according to the statute, Mr. Mullis, for the charge of murder in the first degree pursuant to Iowa Code Section 707.2, you are sentenced to life in prison with no opportunity for parole. There will be no fine issued. You'll be required to submit a DNA sample to the state of Iowa. Uh, the reasons for my sentence today are primarily uh, the statutory requirement, the fact that there is no discretion. Uh, I will also uh, require you to pay a victim restitution uh, to the victim or to the estate of the victim in the amount of $150,000 you will be obligated to pay the court costs associated with this proceeding. You do have the right to appeal from this judgment. Written notice of appeal must be filed within 30 days of today's date. Uh, by statute, according to Iowa Code Section 811.1, subsection two, you cannot be admitted to bail in the event of appeal. Is there anything else the state knows of that we need to cover here today? Mr. Hamrock, anything else that you need to cover on the record today? No, Judge. Okay, we'll stand adjourned and close the record. Thank you, everyone. There are people who do not feel sympathy for a loved one. Despite being close to each other for a prolonged time, they do not hesitate to carry out heinous acts on them. For more videos about these individuals, hit the subscribe button.